Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, now and perhaps forever in virtual mode. Uh, I'm delighted that we've been able to interview a number of you know, important movers and shakers in the financial field over the course of the pandemic. We don't often, however, have any as eminent as uh, my interviewee for today, Sir Howard Davis, is the chairman of NatWest Group. He's a former director of the London School of Economics. He's a, he was the first chairman of the Financial Services Authority. He's also a professor at Sciences Po in Paris. He's had a, a positively stellar career, educated as at the Eton of the Northwest Manchester Grammar School. He went to Oxford. He then went into the FCO. He went to Paris. Uh, he then ended up at Stanford on the Harkness, and after that went to McKinsey's. And as we all know, the world is run by graduates of McKinsey's and Goldman Sachs. They carve up the world. Uh, he then went as a special advisor to Nigel Lawson. He went to the Audit Commission. He went as Director General of the CBI. He was Deputy Governor of the Bank of England. And then thence to the FC, FSA and thence to LSE and now at NatWest. He's the author of a number of books, some of them uh, with uh, my friend and colleague, David Green. Uh, his most recent book in, in 2015 was Can Financial Markets Be Controlled? But he also writes for Project Syndicate and for a number of other outlets as well. And recently he's been writing on Pandexit, Pandexit being uh, the the, the the problems of getting out of the uh, out of the pandemic in which we find ourselves. I have three questions, really, perhaps four that I want to put to him. One, explain what he means by pandexit. Secondly, I want to ask him uh, some of uh, his response to the comments that Senator Elizabeth Warren made to Jay Powell, the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, this week, in which she said very clearly that she felt banks had been taking on too much risk. Thirdly, I want to ask him about the leveling up agenda. He and I are both northerners. And uh, in the background, of course, there is the perpetual issue of China. But let me ask, uh, first of all, Pandexit, Sir Howard, Howard Davis, what's your thoughts on getting out of the mess into which we are at the present time? There's, I think, a series of um, domestic dimensions to Pandexit country by country. Um, and then there's the uh, a global dimension to it. Um, as far as the UK is concerned on pandexit, and this is a point that I, I didn't particularly cover in my recent piece, I think the interesting thing here is what's going on in the labour market. And what we find is rather peculiar situation where we've got more job vacancies than at any time for 20, 25 years. Um, but at the same time, a significant increase in inactivity. And I'm not saying necessarily unemployment, but people who are have one way or another left the workforce. So the number of people employed is about what it was when the crisis began. And the number of people self-employed, part-time and all of that, um, is about a million lower. And if you look at job vacancies, you've got about a million job vacancies and about a million people who are in this category of uh, economically inactive. And there doesn't seem to be much of a link between the two millions in that the million vacancies tend to be various skills uh, from IT, which worries us quite a lot at the moment, um, to HGV drivers, which of course we've heard far too much about in recent weeks. But whatever it is, it's typically people with uh, a decent level of skill. Um, and yet the people are out of the labour market don't seem to be effectively bidding for that. There may also be, this is perhaps your third point, I think, may also be a, di a regional dimension to this, uh, where some of the jobs are not in the places where the people are. Um, so the worry is that unless we can somehow reconnect the job seekers with the job opportunities, then we're going to see a sort of slightly odd combination of things um, with uh, a rising inflation rate and an actually domestically generated inflation 
as opposed to just the commodity prices and exchange mm-hmm. rate we've had mm-hmm. recently. And because people are bidding wages up, and you've got this slightly curious situation of the government telling you to, in rather bizarre, <laughs> I don't recall that at any time in my long career, the government sort of telling people to go and increase uh, wages because that's a better solution than uh, people coming in from the EU. So we've got actually even government-induced wage inflation. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I worry about that uh, leading before too long to the need to tighten financial conditions. So that's the sort of dilemma in the, in the UK. The bit that I was talking about in my article was the, the kind of global consequences of some monetary tightening, particularly, of course, in the US, which is where it really mm-hmm. matters. And whether you would then get a, a situation where you had sort of capital flight from uh, developing countries and where developing countries were still going down um, because they are still a long way away from vaccinating mm-hmm. their population. And mm-hmm. it looks as though they may be facing further lockdowns um, mm-hmm. and the Americans sort of recovering um, and tightening financial conditions just at the time when emerging markets uh, don't need that at all. So that's the that's the sort of global uh, dilemma, I think. So you see, you're saying that within countries there is a danger that that, that pandemic policies will in fact exacerbate disparities, and between countries, ditto. Um, so a widening of gaps both within the UK. I mean, I, I'm rather interested by what you. I'm very interested by what you were saying about uh, the pressure from government to to raise raise wage rates because presumably that will exacerbate the the problem. The regional problem and the difficulties of leveling up, because the places that where raise wage rates will go up will be those that are already prosperous and those uh, because those are the ones that have the skills that the new economy needs. That seems quite likely. So I don't think that's going to work very positively in favour of the leveling up agenda. Uh, actually, I mean it's a difficult thing because on the one hand, as a long term proposition. The idea that emerges from uh, Brexit that it would be better if we upskilled our own workforce, invested more in those people, um, rather than pulling in uh, workers from other places who, who are who might be cheaper. You know, as a long-term proposition, that sounds as if it's got something going for it. You know, hands up who's against upskilling your domestic labour force. The problem is that in the short run. You know, there's been quite clearly quite a significant dislocation in the labour force here. Mm-hmm. Um, and quite a lot of people have left. Uh, we're not even sure quite how many because they weren't really recorded whether they were here or not. Um, but quite a lot of people have, have left. I think we know that. Um, and we can see particular pinch points. And yet to say, to, to make this long-term observation about what would be a, a sensible long-term structure of the economy, Fine, but it's quite a long-term thing. It is not going to solve the problem in the next three to six months, or even really three to six years, probably, uh, because it probably involves a huge additional investment in vocational education. I mean, those are the sorts of things, I think, that uh, when we come on to about levelling up, that Andy Haldane is going to have to be wrestling yeah. with. Well, let, let me ask you about that. What should Haldane and Go be, be looking to do in, in terms of the levelling up agenda? Where would you put your... Uh, emphasis at the present time. Yeah, I mean, I had a, a, a quite a long conversation with him about it uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, I think, uh, and I suspect that this is where you know he, he's sympathetic to this point of view, that the kind of infrastructure type of leveling up investment will really only take you so far. I mean, there are some areas. Um, I mean, you and I know uh, that getting from Manchester to Sheffield or Manchester to Leeds is a sort of ridiculous enterprise and longer than getting from London to Paris. And, um, you know, so there are some things there where I think you can see a, quite a strong argument for improving uh, the, those conurbations, particularly, I think, the Northwest one, actually, because it is... You know, there are three quite decent cities, but where the connections mm-hmm. between them are, are limited. So there's a bit to be done on the infrastructure side. But the clear message of, seems to be, if you look at what's really successful, is the universities are a, a, a dynamic uh, agent of uh, growth. And 
yet the vocational side is definitely weaker. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of his focus should be on how we can achieve a step jump in vocational training and the, in creating the sort of skill base in these areas, which will match the demands of the of the economy. Just and, define for me what you mean by vocational training, because everybody wants to go to university. Everyone wants, wants the university scarf. They want to go to the pub and play rugby for the university. Uh, we have 130 universities in the country. Do we really need 130? Or couldn't we convert those into places where people can take short-term courses on plumbing and uh, electricity and computing? Yeah, I think... Um... Uh, I'm not sure that you're quite right now that um, everybody wants to go to university. Um, uh, that, you know, the proportion has gone up quite a bit. Some of it, I think, people who, well, there wasn't much else to do, so they might as well go. But I think that the uh, fee regime, and it looks as if that's going to be made a bit tougher um, mm -hmm. in the future, and people are going to have to pay back a, a somewhat earlier, um, mm -hmm. is, quite, uh, is quite a serious calculation for people to make. And if you say, you know, will a degree, in, I mean, the, you know, the cliche is always the degree in media studies from central mm -hmm. lecture or something, but I mean, I actually don't even just mean that. What about a degree in English from Keel? <laughs> yeah. University? But it's not clear that that is really worth £53,000 if you look at it purely as an, as an investment and return calculation. I mean, you know, you read some nice books about it. So I think that there's a, a sense that not everybody thinks that this is a great idea. We, for example, here at NatWest, we have flipped our recruitment so that we are now recruiting, as of this year, more apprentices than graduates. Hmm. I mean, we're still recruiting 250 graduates this year, which is you know, still quite a significant uh, investment. I talked to them all last week. Um, but we are recruiting, I can't remember what it is, but it's nearly 400 um, apprentices, um, and that's you know not plumbing, but uh, you, you eventually mm -hmm. rescued yourself, I think, by saying computing as well, as <laughs> because you know vocational <laughs> is not just plumbing. Um, but you know we are finding that people coming out of uh, FE colleges with uh, decent um, IT skills, and things, you know, that's quite attractive uh, to us, um, mm -hmm. and we can use those people effectively, uh, and we can grow them. And so I think it's, you know, that kind of thing. I, I don't think it's a lost cause at all. I suspect that we might get to a point where, you know, the proportion going into universities is um, we get to the limit. I mean, it's a, a going back to this, I find it quite interesting. I was actually, one of the things you didn't mention about my somewhat exotic CV is that at one point I was actually on the board of a, a, a former polytechnic, hmm. the month actually, just as it, switched from being a poly to being a university. The real driver at that point, which is in the early 90s, was because these people wanted to expand internationally. And they saw the future as being Malaysian, Singaporean students who would pay higher fees. And that if you went to um, Malaysia and said, would you like to come to Leicester Polytechnic? <laughs> um, or uh, to, um, I don't know, uh, Peoria University. Mm -hmm. Then, because it was called a university, Peoria University, which might well have been far lower grade than Leicester Polytechnic. I don't know if there is a university in Peoria, but, you know, that's cliche place one quotes. Um, and therefore, the, the, the advantage of the name change was, was for international marketing. Mm -hmm. I think, personally, I think it was a mistake. It, it was a Thatcher mistake um, because... I think that it oriented those institutions into growth internationally, mm. which is has some benefit, but actually kind of just detached them from the yeah. local economy, which was what they had been serving before. With part of they were part of the local government, so they had partnerships with local employers and stuff. I'm not saying some of them don't have that, but it oriented them in a different direction. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that you know. Going back to the binary line is a rather unfashionable observation, but personally, I don't think that would be such a bad thing. Or creating, you know, FE colleges which have higher status and greater and better local 
uh, links. I mean, it, this was part of the ideology too by, uh, by Mrs. Thatcher, who wanted to take them away from local government because she wanted to, she didn't like the fact that they were run by local authorities. It didn't hurt MIT to be the Institute of Technology. Uh, can, can I just ask you one thing though? Uh, Manchester benefited, and I think enormously, or Salford benefited enormously from uh, the move of the BBC. Would you take any other, as it were, prestige organisations and forcibly move them to uh, Gateshead or wherever? Well, they're taking the Treasury to Darlington, um, which will be uh, part of the Treasury. Um, I think that the, the Manchester one has been pretty successful because it was, I mean, although there was a moment of which they said, yes, we're going to, increase of media city and all of that it had actually been going on for quite a long time you know there was quite a significant bbc manchester and oxford road for a long time and there was a, a lively arts community in manchester on which it could build and, and obviously sport which is done from manchester and that's a lot of what's there actually you know was in manchester's a fantastic sporting center so. so there was quite a lot on which to build it wasn't completely uh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a flying saucer sort of landed um, on, on a new planet. And so mm -hmm. I think, you you know, if you can find those connections where there is some plausible link and some organic link, you know, I, I can see that that can make sense. But I think you've got to be a bit careful about it. You know, there have been other examples. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know in detail, but, you know, my impression is the statistics office, for example, in South Wales, Mm. As I understand it, pretty well everybody there goes on the train from London. So it hasn't really been because it just happened. There wasn't a the, the root of a, of, a, of a good statistical community, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you've got to be a bit careful about it. But I suspect there's, there would be some examples where it'd be worthwhile. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> when it comes to rail, you need two trains going north for every one train coming south. Really, um, can I ask you uh, about um, banking um, specifically? Just your thoughts on what Elizabeth Warren was saying and um, clearly criticising Jay Powell for what she felt was relaxing bank um, regulation at a time when uh, the banks are, if you like, extraordinarily profitable and building up all sorts of risk, in her opinion. Do you share her concerns? Not really, no. I mean, I, the situation in the States is somewhat different uh, from here. And... Um, the regulatory pendulum did swing back a bit um, in the US uh, under uh, Trump, um, and particularly uh, Randy Qualls, the Fed governor responsible for uh, supervision. And he did take a, a somewhat different view from his predecessor. There were some amendments to the Volcker rule, uh, which have uh, you know, really relieved some of regulations, but the main changes actually have been to do with smaller, um, you know, community banks, and uh, you know that they have been relieved of some of the capital uh, requirements. Um, and I don't find, I don't think that they have been engaged in extravagant risk taking as a result of that. So I, I don't really. I didn't really see this, and I'm not quite sure what she was specifically referring to. I mean, the capital markets have been very lively, and that's why they've been making a lot of money. I mean, you know, the equity market's um, pretty racy in the U.S., as we know. Mm -hmm. And um, but but I don't think that the U.S. banks have been overall taking on an inordinate amount of risk. You know, they, of course, have access to the securitization market and where European banks don't, so that they parcel up a lot of their loans and, um, and take, send them off. And the US banking system, you know, is considerably smaller in relation to GDP than is the case in Europe. Um, you know, the US bank loans, last figures I saw, is about 60% of US GDP. Whereas in Europe, it's about 110% of European GDP because of the relatively smaller capital markets mm -hmm. in Europe vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I personally think if you look at worrying trends in the financial sector, core bank lending is not where you really would look. That mm -hmm. does not seem to me to be 
particularly uh, racy. And bank capital, uh, you know, banks have got stronger capital in Europe than in the, in the US on the whole. But still, the US banks are, are all meeting Basel III and they're all in the 11, 12% sort of uh, core, core tier one. So I know I, I, don't, I don't see it actually. Right. But uh, let me ask you about non-bank challenges. I mean, the, is, is risk being pushed into parts of the financial services sector that, if you like, the regulators don't have as good a handle on? Yes, I think that's clear. Um, uh, if you look at the growth of, um, uh, the, of, of the sort of financialization, if you like, mm. you know, you can see that banks um, are now below 50% of the financial assets even in, in the UK. And the growth has been in um, what the Financial Stability Board calls NBFIs, non-bank financial institutions. Mm. And then they try to break that down and to sort of hedge funds and money market funds and stuff. And the biggest category is something called other, um, <laughs> which is not particularly helpful. Um, and there are clearly some signs of strain in some of that other category. Um, you know, I think peer-to-peer -peer lenders have had a bit of a rough time in the last uh, couple of years. And some of them you know, have closed to new business or some of them have just gone for wholesale funding and abandoned the retail offer. You can see, so you can see some strains uh, there. Um, but yes, I mean, I, th there's no doubt that at an aggregate level, if you look what's happened, as you've increased capital in the banking system and made it safer, yeah, but you've made its ability to, you've constrained its ability to extend credit, but it's slightly more expensive because of the reserves you have to keep, then credit has emerged elsewhere. But let, I mean, let, can, let me ask you to break down that other a little bit. Peer-to-peer -peer, peer lenders are pretty marginal. I mean, PE, yeah. private equity, um, hedge funds, there are many bigger players in that space, are there not? Yes, uh, but um, the, if you look at what the Financial Stability Board does, it sort of looks and says, well, what are the worries here? Okay. Now, you know, if, if rich people put their money in hedge funds and lose it, there you go. You know, that's not going to be systemic. Um, <clears throat> they're not going to ask for public support. Well, they might try, but they're not going well, to. Well, they always do. Come on. Go. But I mean, you know, Very rich not. people. <laughs> <laughs> and similarly, um, with private equity, if it's genuinely equity, I mean, these people grow and then lose money, and that, that's not a concern. The concern the FSB have is where some form of maturity transformation is uh, in play or where there is a retail dimension somewhere where you know, there are people who might have to be bailed out if they lost their money for political uh, reasons. So you know, that's why I, you know, don't, I don't think I spend a lot of time worrying about hedge funds or private equity, um, because I don't see that's going to be systemic. I don't think it's going to be a problem for small investors, small savers, et cetera. Whereas in some of the things like money market funds or some of the um, like property funds, you know, we've had that problem here, uh, which essentially is maturity transformation because they're taking in money in, but from investors who think that they can get it out mm -hmm. um, pretty much on demand. Um, mm -hmm. And yet that's invested in property transactions, which are going to be extremely difficult to unwind. And as you saw, we were one or two M&G funds, for example, um, you know, where they had to close those funds uh, mm -hmm. because uh, there's no way they could sell enough properties to pay people out uh, uh, on the timescale envisaged. So I think those are the areas you, you've got to look at in the non-bank financial sector. Where is it that they are undertaking maturity transformation and particularly mm -hmm. on the back of access to small savers? Those are the, those are the sort of hotspots and pinch points, I think, in the system. A little leap from that to cryptos. Um, do you do you worry about the growth of crypto trading, particularly, I guess, at the retail end? Um, do you do you worry that uh, uh, what was a fad is becoming a sort of obsession? Yes, this is probably in the bank at the moment. Uh, one of our biggest, maybe our biggest worry. Um, if you link it to uh, essentially fraud and financial crime where we know that the incidence of fraud in the crypto sector, broadly defined, 
is much, much greater. We now believe that there are more individuals in the UK with investments in crypto assets than have investments in the equity market. Whew. And that's quite a worrying thing. I mean, I'm afraid I am a pretty uh, hostile to a lot of this. I'm afraid I'm in the sort of Nouriel Rubini camp on this because I ask myself, what are the, what is the use of these things? Mm -hmm. They are not useful in transactions. There are very few transactions. Um, El Salvador, are, you can buy a Coke. <laughs> yes. Or you can buy Coke. <laughs> You can buy coke, and you know, so you can buy drugs on the dark web. Uh, you know, and that's that's fine, but um, that's not a big amount of my expenditure. So, um, I don't think uh, it, it's very useful as a transaction. Is it useful as a store of value? Well, uh, it's highly uh, volatile, and you would hardly advise people to put a large proportion of their assets into something uh, like that. And then the third thing is. Um, you know, is it an asset which is usefully correlated? Because otherwise you might say, well, because gold is largely useless, mm. you know, in one sense. Mm. But, you know, over time, gold has found a valid place in people's portfolios because it does have some reasonably predictable correlations or inverse correlations with other assets. So if you want to try to uh, balance portfolio and protect your assets from volatility, gold can be, you know, useful part of it. I've not seen any analysis which tells me uh, that in order to produce a sort of balanced, um, you know, risk-adjusted portfolio, that crypto is any more use to me than spending 10% of it on the horse race. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I don't think the returns are in any way correlatable. So mm -hmm. it's gambling, as far as I can see, um, with a sort of libertarian veneer on top of it yeah. saying you know we are creating a new currency system which um mm. you know would be uh, allows us to be liberated from the dead hand of the federal reserve and, and all of that you know well, if you're interested in that stuff then fine so i'm afraid i'm pretty hostile to this and i think that you know you should put a big sign on the door saying abandon hope all ye who enter here um and I think that you must advise people if you're asked, you know, that it could only be a small proportion of their assets. The environmental stuff is a disaster. The mining, the electricity cost of this mining is huge. So I'm, I'm very, very um, sceptical about it. And I, do, I think that, you know, I sort of, I'm not always a sympathizer for the Chinese government. I have to say we might come on to that. But, you know, in some ways I could see the instinct. You know, they just ban the damn stuff. You know, what, uh, why, why beat about the bush here? Because part of me has, a, has a, 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 some sympathy for that. Yes, but one of the reasons the Chinese are cracking down on cryptos is because they're introducing their own digital renminbi. And what about central bank digital cash? Uh, <clears throat> sure that that's really true, Andrew, actually. I mean, mm -hmm. the way I see the, uh, I think there's a huge, huge distinction between cryptos and uh, central bank digital currencies. I mean, they, the, the governor of the Swedish central bank, I had dinner with that was been just before the lockdown, I guess. And, and he said to me, I put it rather interestingly, I thought, he said, since 1668, when this Riks Bank was formed, <laughs> somewhat before the Bank of England, um, individual Swedes have been able to hold a direct claim on the central bank. Mm -hmm. And that's been a sort of root of their you know, financial stability, if you like. They've always been able to do that. And now, as cash is disappearing extremely rapidly from the Swedish economy, has been doing for a while, is that, you know, I can see a point where there won't be any cash and they won't be able to have a direct claim on the central bank. And we must mm -hmm. allow them to have that. That's what we should uh, provide for. And that's the sort of motivation for the e chrono mm -hmm. And that's a completely different thing mm -hmm. from cryptocurrency. About the only thing that's the same about it is that you access it through a computer or a mobile phone. But it's nothing, mm -hmm. there's nothing the same about this at all. It's not meant to be a volatile asset. It's not meant to be a store of value. I mean, it's meant to be a predictable store of value and a transaction mechanism. It's not, um, you know, an investment tool in the way that pound notes are not really. Mm -hmm. So, and I think the motivation 
for the central banks uh, has been A, that, that this is allowing them to provide what they've always provided, a certain sure of store of value you know, at the root of the economy. But secondly, um, a worry about uh, stable coins, not cryptos, stable coins. About, and what really spooked them was Facebook um, and Libra, as it is. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, where, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right, so they keep changing the name, uh, but I think it's still the same thing, where they suddenly realised that, you know, they could lose control of the monetary base um, and also, you know, that uh, they, they would just lose control of international payments as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what spooked the central banks, not Bitcoin. I don't think it was any, mm -hmm. in any way a response to Bitcoin. Um, it was a response to stablecoin. Uh, and that's what the, I think the Chinese worry about, that they lose sort of control of the economic system. Do, they, do, uh, banks, do banks worry about it? I mean, in theory, a central bank digital cash could disintermediate the banks. I mean, the, the banks have got to make, the central banks have got to make one or two key decisions here. One is, are they going to do it directly? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, will uh, I in future, have an account at the Bank of England. In mm -hmm. Actually, when I was Deputy Governor, I did have an account at the Bank of England. It was quite useless, actually. If you tried to write a cheque on it in an Indian restaurant on Friday night, you got some very strange <laughs> looks. Like, you know, there, were, there were accounts at that point for staff. Um, but are they going to have a you know, direct uh, account, mm -hmm. as, you know, your wallet at the Bank of England, if you like, or are they going to do it indirectly through the banking system? If they do it uh, indirectly through the banking system, then how will it be controlled? You know, how much would you be able to put in? Everything um, mm -hmm. or not? And the particular drama, of course, is that normally you, the amount of cash you hold in your pocket has been con somewhat constrained by the fact that you knew that if you had a thousand quid in your pocket for a year, you know, you'd lost 5% <laughs> because that's what you would have got normally, you know, putting it into something. Now, of course, if interest rates are, uh, are um, uh, a zero, you know, there's no opportunity cost to hold cash. Hmm. The opportunity cost to hold cash at the moment is that you might get it stolen, but you're not going to get your central bank currency stolen or you assume it, you're not. Uh, and so there's no disincentive. And then the particular other dimension of it, which they haven't really thought about yet, I don't think, is the issue of uh, volatility and sort of bank runs. You know? So maybe normally this would be stable. People would have their money in their, in their NatWest account. They could have some in their central bank account, which is earning nothing. And say so if interest rates get sort of normalized and we're offering them 1%, you know, there's a sort of discipline there. How much do you want to keep in your central bank wallet? How much do you want to keep in your, in your uh, transaction account? But then supposing you pick up your newspaper and you say, and it says, you know, NatWest has just lost a lot of money on something or other, and people are worried in the city about NatWest. Woo! You know, uh, what are you going to do? And you can do it with one click, and you put the money, you've switched your money into the central bank. Mm -hmm. Then what does the central bank do? Put it all back. But then the credit risk on NatWest has gone very, very quickly from you, Hilton, to Andrew Bailey. Um, you know, switched Andrews uh, almost, um, you know, instantaneously. Um, and if all of these deposits then do flip into the central bank, are they going to extend credit? Mm. And how are they going to do that? Are they going to have their own credit department and decide if Hilton is worth having giving mm -hmm. money to a mortgage or not? I don't think they want to do that. So there's all kinds of very interesting design questions which they've not addressed. And my concern about CBDCs is up to recently, they've been seen as kind of driven by the tech guys. You know, this is kind of a technological exercise. But actually, it raises fundamental questions about what the central yeah. bank role is and the intermediation within the, um, the, the commercial banks. Is the central bank going to extend credit in any circumstances? Mm. If it's not, then how is it going to constrain? And will there be a limit on how much you have? You know, all of these things are still not resolved. And I, I, it worries me a lot at the moment. Um, and um, I think there's got to be a much stronger dialogue between the BIS and, uh, and the central banks and the, uh, and the commercial banking system.
Yeah, I certainly can't think that they'll do anything other than if they do introduce it, CBDC, that it'll have to be done through the banks. But let me ask you one final question, China. Um, we we worry enormously about Evergrande. We worry about more, perhaps more broadly uh, the property sector in China. But there are lots of other issues there. China, Xi Jinping seems to be trying to produce a kind of new non sissified man, which uh, sounds awfully like uh, many other failed attempts by authoritarian leaders over the years. Are you worried about where China is at the present time? Well, I think there's uh, the financial dimension and there's perhaps a sort of political dimension, which I'm less uh, uh, expert on. But on the financial side, it's quite interesting, actually. I was teaching a course on this um, last year week and in, in Paris and um, on this. What I was teaching, teaching on was sort of financial stability, you know, and they, post the financial crisis, people have done a lot of work on trying to devise metrics for financial st inst instability, you know, looking at what, what would we, what would have told us the last financial crisis was on the way if we looked at, mm -hmm. if we looked at it in the right way. And people have tried to sort of create indices and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the IMF does it and all kinds of people do it. And I was just chucking up slides and showing the my students sort of what. And if you look back at the IMF's financial stability report in April of this year, which is the last one, there's one coming out next month. It says, number one, issues that, that they think you should be worried about is um, uh, credit to um, the Chinese property sector. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, the IMF's mm -hmm. forecasting record is not great, as you know, <laughs> but, you know but for once, so they seem to have got this, got this right. And yet... People, you know, seem to sort of pile in to uh, mm -hmm. even to Evergrande as late as July. Some very big international institutions were piling, were still piling in there and buying their bonds. Um, so it's an interesting question as to, you know, whether um, we still we are yet really looking hard enough at these um, areas of, of potential instability in in China. Um, now the Chinese have got quite a lot of tools to deal with this you know they, they've got powerful central institutions and they're not too worried about things like whether you know this is within the regulatory perimeter or not which you'd often hear from the fca or the sec well we couldn't do this because it wasn't really within our i don't know, you don't hear that much <laughs> they don't like the look of it they sort of intervene and then worry a bit afterwards as to whether they had the power to do that um so i but i do think that they have been, uh, you know, a bit permissive um, with some of these sectors, and that um, you know, over a long period of time, they've had quite a good record up to now of using the dials to offset, you know, potential property bubbles. Mm -hmm. You know, they've done it several times in Shanghai. You know, sort of said suddenly, well, sorry, you've got to put down thirty percent deposits, and you know, you, you, yeah, you, you're. Uh, loan to income ratios have to you know have to be not as much. They've got plenty of tools to use, and they do seem to have, you know, perhaps I think uh, somehow not been as artful as they usually are. But I know they're worrying about it, and I have connections with the Chinese regulators. It is something that they are very concerned about. The broader question of Chinese politics, as I say, is well above my my pay grade. Um, the only thing I would say is that I think they still, in the financial area, where I um, do interact with the Chinese I mean, International Advisory Board of the Chinese Banking and Insurance Regulator and the Securities Regulator, actually a separate separate one. You know, they still are pretty open to uh, ideas, and they you know they still appreciate the the links between their financial system and overseas. So. That hasn't the tone there has mm -hmm. not changed in anything like the same way as the tone in relation to the Taiwan Straits and, and things have, have, mm -hmm. have changed. You know, they still there's still strong uh, interactions and on the international advisory board. They still got Americans on there. They you know they've not sort of tried to impose any kind of sanctions on the advice that they take and who they listen to, etc. So, you know, there's some encouragement perhaps there that they still recognize that their international economic and financial systems are very entwined with the West and there is a decent dialogue. And therefore, that these uh, points of tension are, are geo 
political. I just, than... I just worry very slightly about the fact that uh, Western pension funds have been piling into Chinese stocks that are listed on Western exchanges. It's not just the 800 billion that's, uh, that's actually invested in China, but it's also uh, through Chinese institutions that have been raising money in the West. Um, is that an issue in Europe as well as in the US? It clearly is an issue over here. Yes, to some, to some extent, although I think probably we haven't done as much uh, of that kind of investment. Um, and I do think you have to be pretty careful about what you're getting into and look uh, hard at um, uh, you know, what the, where the ultimate ownership of these things is and um, where, what your liquidity mm-hmm. is. That, that, I think, is worrying, though. I don't think it's not an issue for Nat West, so I I haven't really focused on it. Haven't. Okay, an issue for Nat West clearly is um, you know what what government policy in the UK is going to be. If you were writing uh, Bojo's speech for the Tory Party conference, what would you like to hear him say? Um, that um, it was all a terrible mistake, and we're going back. <laughs> 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 On Brexit, I mean, um, uh, I think that um, we do have to say that we are ready to write, write the public finances at the at the appropriate time, and I think the appropriate time is looming, because as Mark Carney once memorably said, you know, we do rely here on the kindness of strangers, in that we do sell a lot of our debt internationally. And we're not like the Japanese who've been able to survive with huge debt to GDP ratios because the domestic savers buy JCBs and seem to be happy to carry on doing so. Uh, That's not the case for us. And I think we've perhaps a bit forgotten in um, uh, in all all of crisis of the last few years that you know, mm. we, we could be vulnerable to a buyer strike in the guilt market. And we have to be sure that we are, um, you know, managing our finances. And I think this is, from what you hear, I think this is what Sunak quite well understands. You know, he knows that the UK doesn't have an absolute right to have access to funds, to fund the deficit, whatever it is, which sort of the US does, you know, I mean, as mm-hmm. the, mm-hmm. the exorbitant privilege of being the dollar then means that you're pretty much sure that you can fund your deficit and you don't really care to, too much about the level of the dollar because uh, you're a continental economy. But the UK, you know, sterling has been weakening quite a bit um, just recently, nervousness about the economy. I think that, you know, we need, it's fine to have the slogans about building back better and, and levelling up, but I would like to hear that that was going to be conditioned by a view that we can't, you know, we, the world does not owe us a living here, um, and we have a fund, we have a, a structural trade deficit which we have to fund, and we have a big public deficit which we have to fund, and we have to behave, and um, you know we can't afford to take huge punts, uh, which uh, on on poorly based in, in investment uh, assessments. So. I now, you know, I don't think that's going to get them dancing in the aisles at the Conservative conference. But I do hope that we hear a bit about about stability and sustainability in a financial sense as well as a environmental one. On that very optimistic note, can I thank Sir Howard Davis? Uh, as always, we've covered a huge amount of ground, and I forgot, of course, to ask you about the future of the city in a post-Brexit world. But leaving aside that one, uh, can I thank all of you for watching? Many thanks.